It's an exciting message, isn't it? Can you see how our faith, the Bible, would be viewed as irrelevant with the real world out there? See, what that bishop's done, he's adopted, if you like, a non-Christian worldview. A worldview we've represented like a set of glasses or a framework or a filter through which you interpret all reality. Once you reach the age of understanding, you develop a worldview. Your worldviews are very important. They will affect the way you live. Let me give you an example here. See, if you think that God is creator, there is meaning and purpose to your life. But if you're just evolved pond scum, as one scientist said, makes you feel kind of special, doesn't it? There's no meaning and purpose to your life. You're just a giant cosmic accident. By the way, you might live your life in accordance with that premise. As a man thinks in his heart, so he is, the Bible says. See, ladies and gentlemen, what you believe about where you came from will ultimately determine your worldview. What you believe about where you came from will determine what you think happens to you when you die. If you've come from nothing, you're going to nothing. But if the Bible's history is true, if God is creator, the decisions you make in this life will affect where you spend eternity. See, sadly, I, we've tended only to teach Bible stories in the church. You know, Adam and Eve, the great flood, Jonah and the, and the great fish, and the kids go off to college and they get bombarded with the so-called facts of science. George Barner, a Christian pollster, here in the United States, well-known, been researching the church for many years. He showed that 70% of Christian kids brought up in a Christian home will walk away from their faith by the time they enter college. You know, when we hear quotes like that, we always sort of think, it's, ah, that's, that's somebody else out there, right? <laughs> but if he's right, if that's correct, and I could show you a quote, for example, that showed that the Southern Baptists have produced that 88% of their children are leaving the church. So are we talking about somebody else's kids? or potentially 70% of the kids here in this church if we don't do something bad, if we don't teach them how to think about the issues, whereas our public education system tends to tell them what to think. See, this is what they're being taught by our great teachers and philosophers at university. Bertrand Russell, he says, we are just a curious accident in a backwater. Peter Atkins from Oxford, he says, we're just a bit of slime on the planet. It's pretty encouraging stuff, isn't it? Stephen Jay Gould, remember him? The, arguably the world's most famous scientist at the time. Uh, professor of paleontology at Harvard. Uh, he's deceased now, so I think he's become a creationist. But anyway, <laughs> he says, we're a fortuitous cosmic afterthought, a tiny little twig on the enormously arborescent bush of life. And here we have Richard Dawkins. I'm sure some of you have heard of him. The most rabid anti-Christian, anti-creationist on the planet today. His books become bestsellers the minute they're released. He's the former professor for the public understanding of science at Oxford. He's the high priest of Darwinism today. He says, we live in a universe which has no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, and nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. Boy, I wonder why they even bother getting out of bed in the morning if they believe that, right? Well, this is what is being taught to our young people today. So have a look at this cartoon. A student says to the other, you seem a bit down. That science class of yours went for ages. What happened? Well, the teacher reckons we're nothing special, that we just came from pond scum. Apparently, we're not much more than highly evolved apes. What are they teaching in your next class? Self-esteem. <laughs> Many a true word spoken in jest, they say. Anybody here been to the land down under, my home country at all? Anybody here been there? What do you think of it, mate? Beautiful, great. Anybody else? Okay, great. You know, lots of Americans, they see pictures of Australia, you know, palm trees and white sandy beaches, and you know what? It actually is like that. I often uh, tell people the reason Americans seem to like Australia so much, I think it's because it's full of Australians, but anyway. Um, but the reality is, ladies and gentlemen, that beautiful country, we have the second highest youth suicide rate out of all of the developed countries in the world, out of all the OECD countries. It's a crisis, an epidemic in our country. But you see, the meaning of, any, of anything is actually tied up in its origins. If you teach people they've come from nothing, they're going to nothing, then, hey, exams and pressures and hormones running rampant in teenage years, why, why bother at the end of it all? And you know, I've had dozens of conversations with public high school kids who actually think that way. Well, what do we do? What do we do with these claims of science? You know, what about these claims of millions of years? Don't scientists prove these things? Well, here's the second key point, because when we're dealing with the past, whether it's creation or evolution, we're dealing in the area of what we call historical science or origin science, things that happened in the past that we were not there to see, okay? But uh, the type of science that you and I understand when we just hear the word science 
is actually what we call operational or experimental science. It can build cell phones and, and uh, airplanes and all this type of things, laptop computers. See, it deals with experiments that you can do in the present. You can repeat those experiments. You can observe the results. You know, if I wanted to test the theory of gravity, right, I could run up on the church roof and take a nice swan dive off. I could do it in the present. I could repeat it. I wouldn't be around to observe the results, but you folks would be, right? You could say, yep, gravity really works. What a mess. But evolution, well, it's supposed to happen in the past one time. Do we see evolution happening today? No, we don't. Uh, high schoolers, people in college, you'd be thinking, well, what about natural selection? Actually, natural selection was invented by creationists. We do see change in creatures. I don't have time to talk about it this morning. But if you come tonight, as part of my UFO presentation, I'm going to be talking about a natural selection. And that, that'll be a real key for you folks. Do you know, I mentioned this at a church in South Africa some years ago, and uh, this man came up to me to robustly challenge me after the meeting. And he said, you creationists, you go on about operational science, you ignore examples of it. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, fossils. He said, everybody knows that fossils uh, take millions of years to form. We can see it, slow, gradual processes. I said, really? Now, how would you answer a question like that? See, because questions are an opportunity, aren't they? People don't want to talk about Jesus, but somebody asks you about fossils when you're talking to them about the Bible. See, most people believe that fossils take millions of years, but if you ask them to name any fossils, they're not going to be able to do it because they don't know that much about it. And I was actually trying to show this man he was basing his whole eternal destiny on something he actually knew little about. And I showed him this picture here. See what this is? This is a really neat fossil. Can you see a fossil ichthyosaur, an extinct marine reptile? But see what's really neat about it? There's the baby coming out of the birth canal. Now, mums, some of you here may have had very slow, difficult, long labors, but can you imagine giving birth slowly over millions of years while you were slowly being fossilized, right? <laughs> But when I went to school in grade 11, these are standard Australian high school biology textbooks, I was taught that this is how fossils are formed. Standard grade 11 biology. You've got books like this. I've seen them at elementary school age here in this country. And here's old Freddy fish swimming along, and he dies, and he sinks to the ocean floor. Now, while he's lying on the ocean floor, have a look at these high mountains. There they were. Now they've gone. How long did that take? A little bit of mud, a little bit of sediment gradually eroding out over millions and millions of years and burying the fish and then the process starts again and maybe that's how we get that geologic column, you know, that we see in the textbooks. But ladies and gentlemen, let's put our thinking caps on today. What usually happens when a fish dies? It floats. Some of you are looking at me rather strangely. If you've got some expensive tropical fish or goldfish at home, do the experimental method tonight. Go home, put a teaspoon of cyanide in your fish tank, right? Find out whether Goldie sinks or floats. But what would happen in the real world? That fish is going to float. Other fish are going to come in, chew some lumps off. The carcass sinks to the bottom, crabs, crustaceans. You're lucky if you've got a piece of backbone left after a couple of days. So how do you get a fossil like that? See, what you need, here's old Freddy fish swimming along. You need a lot of mud and a lot of water and a little bit of time. You can bury the fish quickly in those layers. And before long, you can get yourself a rapid fossil. Now, you might be thinking, well, okay, Gary, I can understand about the layers and it can be buried quickly, but it's actually the process of fossilization, or more correctly known, permineralization. That's where the organic material is slowly replaced, turned to stone. Doesn't that take a long period of time? Well, actually, it doesn't. <laughs> All you need are the right cementing conditions to get a rapid fossil. Here's a picture we featured in Creation magazine. It's a fossil hat. It was a soft felt miner's hat buried in a volcanic explosion in New Zealand, and 20 years later, they unearthed it out of the cabin and I suppose you could say it evolved into a hard hat, right? But <laughs> it actually had turned to stone in less than 20 years. This one from my home state of Western Australia, right up in the far northwest in the outback, a solid rock ring exposed at low tide up in the far northwest in the outback. And what do you think that was? Yeah, lots of people say a tire, but we broke it open. It was a roll of fossilized fencing wire. Can you see the individual strands there? Turned to stone in less than 50 years. You remember when the station workers were going through, rolling up the old rolls, throwing them in the ocean, hoping they would decay. Family who subscribed to Creation magazine, walking along a beach in Brisbane, one of the young fellows now suddenly develops a thirst for God's world around him because he sees it through a different set of glasses. And one young fellow noticed a stone that was different to the others. He, they took a photo, they picked it up, got a surprise when they turned it over because inside was a toy car. So that shows you that rocks can form quickly under the right condition. See, but we're all led to this idea of millions and billions of years. Where did that idea come from? Here's the second key point this morning, ladies and gentlemen. Whenever you hear the claims, they cannot do tests 
on anything to prove the age of it. Radiometric dating does not work like that. I don't have time to talk about it, but we've got books out there on that subject. The idea of the millions of years came from these rock layers.